My name is Zula, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Level Zero Health. We're pioneering continuous hormone monitoring using first-of-their-kind DNA-based sensors that allow you to track your hormones wherever you are. Hi everyone, hormones, they regulate almost everything in your body, from even before you were born to how you feel right now and throughout your all major life events, puberty, aging, reproduction, and so much more. That data is critical, yet today, if you wanted to measure them, you have to physically go to a lab for someone to take a blood draw. That's not only invasive, it's disruptive, and only a single data point. Until now. Now I can wear this, a DNA-based sensor that allows me to track my hormones wherever I am. Now is the time to build this company and launch this product. Awareness in the population is rising rapidly. Continuous glucose monitors have normalized devices like ours, and most importantly, this technology has only been possible for the last 18 months due to expiration of foundational patents and a breakthrough in research last year. And we're leading the race with our own breakthrough. Just about three weeks ago, we showed that our sensor measures all of our analytes across 98% of human clinical range. That's one of the biggest challenges in sensors, going into such low concentrations in the human body. We have more great news. Our goal is to launch our continuous hormone monitoring device. It monitors your hormones for up to two weeks at a high frequency. But we'll also have figured out an accelerated path to market with our patent-pending intermittent monitoring device. It has a shorter R&D timeline, lower regulatory burden, and allows us to bring immediate value and build presence in the market, while also building our data and learning to um, grow us further. Let's have a look at our device. Can we have a camera? Cool. So this is our intermittent device. It allows you to take multiple measurements throughout the day. This particular one has three measurements with two analytes each. It's a tiny microneedle. It's half a millimeter long. So when the user wants to take a measurement, they press a button that inserts the needle and extracts interstitial fluid out for external analysis. We're not going to show what's happening behind the scenes. It's all nanoscale, so we can't actually like, show <laughs> in nano. So if we can sw switch the video, please. Cool. So when uh, you insert the needle, it extracts the interstitial fluid. And the paper inside is uh, coated with single-strand DNA. These short DNA sequences are almost programmed to bind to each of the analytes. And when they bind, they produce a color change. So the user can take out the paper strip and put it into a camera box where they can take the precise measurement, send it to the user app, as well as the clinician portal, where they can see this data real time. Just to give you a bit of a perspective, continuous glucose monitors truly revolutionize diabetes care. The company that makes CGMs makes four billion a year, and that's just from glucose. We're addressing markets much bigger than that. Starting with IVF and low testosterone, where clinics and patients know the pain. For IVF, you literally have to go to the clinic to take a blood draw every two days for weeks. For low testosterone, for diagnosis, as well as throughout treatment, you need to take a blood draw. We're completely replacing those blood draws, allows, allowing clinicians to take more measurements remotely, non-invasively, and show real-time data. In the last three months alone, we've secured 3 million in LOIs from some of the leading clinics, and they will convert to 8 million ARR at full adoption on the second year. These clinics are also our design partners, and most importantly, we're validating our device on-site in humans in six to nine months already. This is just the beginning. This is a kind of a breakthrough that we need for all sorts of markets. Individualized contraception dosage, personalized medicine, lifestyle, and so much more. Markets totaling $250 billion. Our initial market opportunity is already massive, with more than half a billion ARR potential in the US alone, just from hardware. 
We've only been around for 10 months, and our small team has been able to move so fast because of how incredible our team members are. We have more than 20 years of experience in DNA-based sensing and nanotechnology. My name is Ola, I'm the CEO and co-founder, and I had a wearable device company at 16 and led multiple enterprises at Palantir. My co-founder, Irene, and CTO developed medical devices at Philips and launched electrochemical sensors before. Our team has now expanded with some of the biggest names in fertility from Harvard, CCRM, Mount Sinai, and HIMSS, and we're very happy to have them. And right now, we're bringing more people, investors and partners, and we're just signed our lead for a six million raise that we're going to finalize in the next two weeks with a little bit of room for strategic investors as well. If there's one thing I would like you to take away, it's this. We're at a precipice of a real change these markets need. A world where your hormone data is as readily available as your heart rate or step count. We're not only here leading the race, we're set to win this market. Thank you. Thank you, level zero health. Judges. Um, maybe I'll start it off uh, as a physician by training. Uh, first of all, this is uh, really, I think needed in terms of, you know, this is an issue uh, that a lot of conditions uh, can be helped by. Um, I think the devil's a little bit in the details, so I'm curious to ask, first of all, you know, baby steps, what is, what do you need to achieve technically to have parity of evidence? I saw you have some FDA clearance uh, idea, so walk through what you need to do before you, go, you get to mass market. I'm sure yeah. you can do some D2C, but first. Of course, um, I'll cover some and then I'll see if Irene wants to add anything. So the most important thing that this technology can do that other devices like urine tests, temperature tests, et cetera, cannot do is correlate directly to blood. The tight correlation that CGMs have because this goes through interstitial fluid. We're building the same data set. So in six to nine months, we're showing that our data across all human ranges in both simulated interstitial fluid and across the populations matches directly to blood measurements. So you can trust it as much as you can trust a blood draw. So that's one on the clinical level to be able to build trust, credibility in research and go to clinical use cases. That's the number one thing. There are a couple of technical things that we need to do to get to that space. So I'll, I'll let Irene answer yeah. that one. Yeah, additionally, we're right now working on modifying our single strand DNAs to capture these analytes in a very, very specific way. So we have already achieved detection in very low 10 nanomolar concentration ranges with these aptamers. The next is we're going to move into real interstitial fluid to first build a data set on the relative abundance of these analytes and then correlating to our sensors. So all of those work is planned to do in the next uh, six to nine months. Great, thank you. We're probably like one of the biggest challenges is going into the ultra low concentrations with which we've already sh kind of solved and shown consistent results. So it's about stabilizing that going one order degree smaller, which is not a big issue given that we went from like 10 micromolar to 10 nanomolar range, stabilizing that and running a validation study in the next nine months or so. And talk a little bit about the regulatory pathway and what precedents you're going to use. Absolutely. So for the continuous device, we're setting a de novo. That is a strategic move. There are a lot of other products that claim to do continuous monitoring, and we want to set exactly what that means. High frequency correlated to uh, blood. So that's de novo for sure. The earlier product is a 510K, particularly for pre progesterone and estrogen monitoring for IVF. Today, those like both urine, saliva, and urine tests are exempt from regulatory altogether. You just notify FDA. But because we're doing interstitial fluid, we're tripping that up to a 510K. So only 90 days to review smaller scale studies uh, that we're gonna be doing with our actual clinical partners as well on site here in the US, as well as in Europe in C kind of in parallel. In Europe, which is actually like double the size of the US, but they have higher price sensitivity, um, there, um, the regulatory pathway doesn't have a distinction between a 510K and a de novo, but today the auditing takes a little bit more time. So the way we think about it is a 510K, lowest barrier, like fastest, most likely. C, we're going to launch at the same time, but it will converge a few months later after the 510K. And a de novo is the most expensive and obviously the lengthiest one that we will do in two, three years for the continuous one. And how high is the spend in these initial applications? And Absolutely. where do you see that going? Yeah. So the initial device is a single time use patch and a camera box. 
the patch itself is $60 to $90, and the patch is $200. So for a single IVF cycle, that's $500, sorry, $440 per cycle. For a medium-sized clinic, we're talking about around 500K ARR, given that they do 1,000 cycles a year. And a typical cycle uh, price is about 15 to 20,000, so it's like a drop in a bucket. It is, in most cases, on par with current price that they spend on operating the lab, but we're also reducing the costs for the clinics. We're getting rid of 80% of their blood draws, full-time employees, what they call satellite labs, where they have in other regions, rural areas, where clinicians travel maybe once a week to see their patients. So it allows us to bring sort of benefit both to patients as well as the clinics themselves. And how do you think about distribution? Is this something that you'd want the end users to opt into themselves or something that you would think the partnerships with the various mm -hmm. uh, clinics would help you distribute? Yeah, how do you think about yeah. that? Yeah, this is all direct B2B large scale sales. So with all of the clinics, it's they're buying it in bulk. In some cases, they want to put it like at the beginning, even the way our LOIs and our growth is scheduled with them is about 10 to 15% adoption rate at the beginning, launching to 25 and 75 over time. 75 is what they think is gonna be the default. In some cases, we think the clinics will probably put a margin on it as well. It's obviously up to them. Um, for example, egg freezing is a very interesting use case where you typically, as a typically single, single uh, woman that doesn't want to deal with fertility at the moment, career driven, doesn't want to come to a clinic every two days. So we can see, like we've heard other uh, our partners say that they might actually add an additional price on top to just do it, not like remotely, completely replace the blood draws. So I would say that uh, distribution is completely through clinics. Over time, we will move B2B to B to C for other use cases like perimenopause and such that are not so centralized as an IVF clinic is, but that's a later, a later time, yeah. And how would the readout work for continuous monitoring versus intermittent? There is so, a readout for the continuous one. So the signal capture is a little bit similar to how the continuous glucose monitors work. You have a sensor that's directly embedded into the interstitial fluid, and it detects the change in concentration proportional to the change in current that's detected. So we're basically directly measuring current, and we can use a low power Bluetooth that syncs to the, the phone and then process it in the cloud and send it back the results, essentially. So it's fully integrated. Yeah. All right, give it up for Level Zero Health. <laughs>